Hi, and welcome back to Microsoft Research's Race and Technology Lecture Series. I'm Nancy Bame. I'm a Senior Principal Research Manager at Microsoft Research, and I'm the lucky person who gets to host this series. I want to thank the rest of the organizing committee, Charlton McElwain from NYU and Hannah Wallach from MSR and Christopher Morris from Microsoft's Marketing Division for bringing together these speakers who are working at the leading edge where race studies and technology studies meet. I also want to thank you for being here today, especially those of you who've been coming regularly. If this is the first time you've attended, welcome. In previous lectures, we've taken humanistic and social scientific perspectives to look at a range of topics. If you've been following along, you've deepened your expertise, you've learned of new areas of scholarship you didn't know existed, or something in between. If you've missed those lectures, they're all available on YouTube, and I'd encourage you to go have a look. Today, we are thrilled to expand the range of topics further, bringing in the brilliant Sohini Ramachandran and her computational biology expertise to the conversation. Dr. Ramachandran is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at Brown University, where in addition to running the Ramachandran lab and mentoring budding undergraduate scientists, she directs Brown's data science initiative and also the Center for Computational Molecular Biology. Among other honors, She's received a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and she's been a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows. Her lab addresses problems in population genetics and evolutionary theory, asking questions like whether some ethnic disease disparities can be explained by genetics, and what genetic data alone can tell us about features of human demographic history. In this talk, she'll be talking about the challenges of interpreting direct to all consumer genetic testing and for personalized medicine. I'll be monitoring questions in the chat and I encourage you to pose them as they arise. We may not get to them until the Q&A, but we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A after the talk. Um, with holidays on the way, our next talk is going to be a little later than usual, but please be sure to set a marker for January 26th when we're going to continue the comp bio uh, exploration with Brandon Ogbunu, who's going to uh, be talking about something he calls the biology nexus. So stay tuned for that. And for now, please join me in welcoming Sohini Ramachandran. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for listening to my talk today. I first want to begin by acknowledging my lab members who I've been privileged to work with on a range of projects and were motivated by many of the questions that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, our work is also enabled by many funding sources that I'm acknowledging here, and we enjoy collaborating with many close colleagues who inspired the topics in this talk today. I'm so thrilled to be a part of this series, and I also appreciate that there's a conversation happening within this conversation of race and technology about genomics, and that's with Professor Talbear and Professor Ugbunu. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance for all the text on this slide, but I wanted to take a moment to define some nomenclature in population genetics, which is my field for you. So first of all, what is population genetics? It's the study of the evolutionary forces that produce and maintain genetic variation in a population. And that begs the question, what is a population from a geneticist standpoint? And I think this is really important to establish up front because this is part of what um, fuels difficult conversations around race and genomics today and throughout history. First, in population genetics, which uses a lot of methods um, drawn from statistics and has a close relationship with the founders of statistics, um, the statistical de definition of a population is relevant. In statistics, a population is the collection of all units on which a study variable of interest can be measured. And in statistics, our goal is to learn the properties of a population from a sample. In biology, the word population has a different meaning. It's a group of individuals of the same species. Often these individuals in a population are considered to be randomly mixing and mating. And because of that, often natural populations of organisms are defined based on their geographic location. And so if we were sampling a series of geographically subdivided groups, we might call as biologists all of those groups populations. What this means for the talk today and for human genetics is that often when we're sampling 
um, genomes from individuals throughout the world, we use geographic terms to describe those collections of samples, which I think is um, becoming more and more problematic and has been problematic over time. Increasingly, population genetic studies refer to the word ancestry when describing um, collections of individual data points, um, genomes from individuals. And I just want to note, and this came up in Professor Talbert's uh, talk as well, that this implicitly assumes a discrete number of ancestry sources. Ancestry um, kind of only makes sense if we have some reference points. And um, as she discussed in her talk, this means that individuals who derive ancestry from multiple sources um, kind of are interpreted um, through the lens of the idea of reference populations, which uh, she really talked about beautifully in her talk. Um, and lastly, uh, the term race does continue to appear in the metadata of many data sets that population geneticists work on, and um, particularly in medical genetic studies. And I would say that um, this term is data that is described as a covariate that's associated with race and population genetics is often treated as a self-identified category, but it might not be self-identified. Again, it's often limited by the number of categories that were used in initial surveys to generate the data, um, which may have even been done through a translator, which may have been a limited set of options, may not actually have been chosen by the individual in the study. Um, and so I want to acknowledge uh, that as well. So, Why is there so much opportunity for genetic data and race to intersect? This is because genetic technologies over time, especially in the last two decades, have led to incredibly large data sets in a rapid amount of time. And I think that this actually makes genomics, especially human genetics, the original field of data science, in my opinion, the original um, ex application area of data-driven research. And I just want to show you what these costs look like over time. So this is data from the National Human Genome Research Institute, which is part of our National Institutes of Health. Um, this shows the cost of sequencing a human genome over time since the draft sequence of the human genome was published. And the cost has plummeted since then. It's outpacing Moore's law. And this figure really summarizes the forces that I think shape the field of population genetics and, and certainly have shaped my career. So um, just to give you a sense, when I was starting graduate school, right after the um, draft sequence of the human genome was published, the cost of sequencing a genome was estimated to be about $61.4 million. Then when I was beginning my faculty career, just a little over a decade ago, the cost had dropped to $31,000. Originally when the human genome was sequenced, um, the goal was a $1,000 genome with the idea that that would enable the incorporation of genomic data into routine medical care. And in fact, today, as you are viewing this talk, we have outpaced that. So now this cost of sequencing a human genome is estimated to be about $562. Um, so what does this mean? This amazing change in cost means that human genetics is not data limited but it's very limited by theory and frameworks with which to make sense of emerging data sets. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. And so what I'd like to do is actually go back a decade to 2010, more than a decade now, um, to talk about the vision that the National Institutes of Health and that many scientists had for what would happen in the last decade with genomic technologies. So in 2011, the National Human Genome Research Institute, which had led the International um, Human Genome Project, published its strategic vision for 10 years ahead, for the, the decade that we've just ended. And this is a figure from that paper, which I think is a really interesting piece to look at and think about genomic technologies with this piece in mind. Um, what this figure shows is what was then considered the main goals of genomic research, so understanding the structure of genomes, understanding the biology of genomes, understanding the biology of disease, 
advancing the science of medicine, and improving the effectiveness of healthcare. And in the bottom are theoretical densities of what the team writing this paper, um, what NHGRI was, was imagining would be the research focus in these different tranches of time moving forward. So I don't want to focus on the bottom part of the plot, but I just want to draw your attention to this idea of, of what in 2011 improving the effectiveness of healthcare with genomics looked like. So it looks like a, a patient in a bed talking with someone who has a sort of tablet and it's got DNA letters on it, right? The idea that we would be in a doctor's office and our genomic data would be a part of routine analysis and determination of therapies. Okay. Um, this is not our reality today. It's in fact quite hard to predict most health outcomes from a genome. And I'll spend time uh, talking about how that difficulty of predicting intersects with race in this talk. So now we've uh, moved forward a decade and there's a new strategic plan from NHGRI, which again, I think is a really important read. Um, and it establishes the highest priorities moving forward from 2020 at what the paper is called the forefront of genomics. And I'm gonna read to you from one particular box in it. So bold predictions for human genomics by 2030. Some of the most impressive genomics achievements when viewed in retrospect could hardly have been imagined 10 years earlier. Here are 10 bold predictions for human genomics that might come true by 2030. Although most are unlikely to be fully attained, achieving one or more of these would require individuals to strive for something that currently seems out of reach. These predictions were crafted to be both inspirational and aspirational in nature, provoking discussions about what might be possible at the forefront of genomics in the coming decade. I wanna focus on three of the 10 predictions that are laid out in this paper. And I also just want us to keep in mind that these are very aspirational from the perspective of the authors. Um, so they may not be achieved. The first is that I wanna focus on. Um, an individual's complete genome sequence, along with informative annotations, will, if desired, be securely and readily accessible on their smartphone. The second, individuals from ancestrally diverse backgrounds will benefit equitably from advances in human genomics. And lastly, research in human genomics will have moved beyond population descriptors based on historic social constructs such as race. So this is my outline for this talk. I'd like to start with each of these predictions and tell you a little bit more about the state of genomics today with respect to them from my viewpoint. So to me, this first prediction um, reads as being actually already realized in some ways. And I think the sticking point, as is the case in most data-driven research, is in how human genetic variation is measured, is analyzed, is interpreted, and used in decision-making. And so what I'm going to do with the next few slides is start with some statements that sound almost like today's version of Brave New World. And I'll actually illustrate how some of these things that might sound fantastical are already our reality in the genomic era. So first, in this kind of uh, futuristic, uh, what see, might seem like a futuristic world, some people might use genetic data in their search for their life partner. So it turns out that this is actually already the case for some people. In particular, um, this company, Doria Shoram, has uh, been around for a few decades and offers genetic testing for Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jewish individuals in order to screen for recessive traits that give rise to lethal or severely debilitating disorders. So their goal is to provide prophylactic rather than diagnostic services to individuals who might be seeking partnerships. So they can determine whether they would like to have a family together or not. Um, they advocate for anonymous secure testing and individuals are tested in large sessions in the past in schools. Now they can view their results individually online, anonymously with a pen. Um, this uh, nonprofit is also called the Committee for the Prevention of Jewish Genetic Diseases. And um, they have really 
made strides in reducing the incidence of very debilitating diseases in the community that uses them. But there's also a social cost to, for example, not participating in testing um, or to questioning testing. Imagine a world where funding for some educational and jobs programs is influenced by genetic data. Well, it turns out that this is already happening all over the world, but also in the United States. And this is actually described really beautifully by Amy Harmon, who writes for the New York Times um, well over a decade ago in this piece in 2007 from her series, The DNA Age, that won her the Pulitzer Prize. And I highly recommend this series um, to any of you interested in reading about DNA and its impact on society. It really holds up and she's actually updated some of the articles recently with new interviews. Um, so what this article highlighted is that about 90% of women who are given a Down syndrome diagnosis um, when gestating a fetus choose to have an abortion. And that means that the population of individuals who have Down syndrome who are born with it is dwindling and there is less institutional support for them, reduced funding for research, even though this is the syndrome that actually launched the field of genetic counseling and prenatal counseling. And there are many states that cover prenatal genetic testing, particularly for Down syndrome. So what does that mean for us as a society when our government incentivizes testing that might lead to these kinds of decisions about termination, what does it mean for individuals who are seeking resources in order to help them? And just to cast this into relief for our own country, about 350,000 individuals in the US live with Down syndrome and about 5,500 children are still born each year. And their average life expectancy is actually 49 years of age. Imagine a world where some people plan travel itineraries based on their genetic data. Well, it turns out that this is already being marketed to people. And just in the interest of disclosure, I'm gonna talk about um, the company 23andMe for a little bit. And I'll note that my laboratory co-led a scientific paper with 23andMe researchers in an academic research collaboration on a phenomenon called uniparental disomy, which was published in the American Journal of Human Genetics. But I no longer have an active collaboration with 23andMe. Many of you might have done the personal genetic test that 23andMe provides. Um, in May 2019, they announced a partnership with Airbnb, and this is from Airbnb's website. You can find it at the URL in the bottom right of the slide. Airbnb says, travel as unique as your DNA. In collaboration with 23andMe, Airbnb wants you to travel in the context of your own roots. So the idea here is that individuals might look at the ancestry that 23andMe infers from their genetic data and be interested in traveling to parts of the world that their DNA um, reflects their ancestry coming from. And I think it's interesting to question who decided on the marketing for this product and partnership because initially, um, and I would say still looking at the website in the last few days, um, it didn't acknowledge that some people who are interested in so-called heritage travel, as it's described on the website, um, might also have ancestors who fled difficult conditions or um, uh, were enslaved or forcibly displaced from their homelands in the past. And there's a little more text from the website that I won't read, but I'll note in the second statement that 23andMe data also shows that the majority of its customers have at least five populations within their ancestry composition report. So derive ancestry from five different sources, which could be at varying um, geographic scales. And this presents many opportunities for one to explore heritage travel. Again, this is from May 2019, um, so it might not be completely accurate. But I think this um, second statement also reflects something that's well known, which is that the composition of the 23andMe database is largely white, um, which is something the company is, is working on. But again, that individuals based on their family history and ancestral background might have different views of so-called heritage travel. Imagine a world where people upload their genetic data without considering information privacy. And one of the features of 23andMe and other direct consumer genetic tests is that they help people connect to biological relatives, including relatives they may not yet know, um, especially for adult adoptees, which is, you know, I think an amazing thing for many people. It can also be very complex to learn about a sibling you didn't know you had. 
Um, but one of the ways that people sometimes search for relatives is actually by uploading their data from a company like 23andMe, which keeps the data secure, to other websites that are less secure. Um, and that enables the data to be easily hacked or to be used um, by law enforcement when, when searching for individuals who may have perpetrated crimes. And actually this technology has been leveraged multiple times in order to solve cold cases and the first well-known cases to find the Golden State Killer. Um, in addition to this though, there are people who choose to upload their genetic data to different sites. And there are people who have their genetic data taken from them when they're detained by law enforcement or when detained at the US border, which makes genetic privacy a really urgent need. And I think it's important to also remember that the composition of our national DNA index system is known to be predominantly black and brown, and it's a data set that's used by Homeland Security and by law enforcement, as well as to solve um, missing persons cases. And it's very different in its demographic composition from a data set like 23andMe. And imagine a world where genetic data analysis is co-opted by extremist groups and used to justify violence. So this is actually already happening today, which you may be aware of. Um, I'll just mention quoting from Wikipedia in order to get the facts completely accurate about the Christchurch mosque shootings. That there were two consecutive mass shootings at mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand during Friday prayer on the 15th of March, 2019. The attack was carried out by a single gunman who killed 51 people and injured 40. And this shooter had a manifesto that's available online. And from his manifesto, the shooter poses and answers this question. And I'm quoting, what makes you believe there are racial differences and that those differences matter? And he writes, research and data, haplogroups, which is a technical term about groups of genetic variation, phenotypes, which is a technical term for traits and globalized testing. In time, the truth will be revealed. So this person was using in part genetics as a way to justify this incredibly devastating act of violence that he then perpetrated. Um, and recent studies in meta research of Twitter engagement with preprints of research articles from BioArchive Online. This article um, by Jed Carlson and Kelly Harris highlights the political skew of the non-academic audiences that are interacting with research online. And what I'm gonna show you is a plot that on the bottom is what I want you to focus on, is the ratio of left-leaning to right-leaning audience interaction. So things on the right of this graph indicate um, topics that right-leaning, non-academic individuals on Twitter are engaging with that are research articles. And on the left, uh, the opposite, more left-leaning audiences are engaging with that. Um, so what I wanna draw your attention to here is that both genetics and genomics are experiencing at least double the engagement from right-leaning non-academic individuals online than are fields like scientific communication, systems biology, immunology, and ecology, which have more left-leaning audiences. This is um, quite statistically significant. And what's really important to know about this is that these white nationalist groups that are, in, there are white nationalist groups that are engaging with this research in my field. And they are not um, deniers of the research. And they're not even misinterpreting the research, but rather viewing it through racist cognition and using it to justify their views of their supremacy. So um, to talk about this first prediction, I would say that the human genome already pervades our everyday life. And what's important for us to know about it is that we are born with our genomes and we can't change our genetic data. And this isn't true for other data that um, we put out into the world or the, that um, systems use to evaluate us. For example, it, may, it can be difficult and certainly di different for different individuals to change a credit score or change our data that we put into social media, but we can change those things and we can't change our genetic data. On top of that, our genetic data contains information not just about us, it contains information about our ancestors, our relatives, as well as our future descendants who may or may not exist at this moment when we upload data. Um, and 
So for that reason, I think that we need to be taught to protect our genetic data. We need to be sure it is protected by systems in our society. And when we think about bias and training and application of automated systems, I think genomic data might be a really um, singularly unique use case with which to evaluate systems and their biases. So the second prediction I wanna focus on from the NHGRI strategic plan for the next decade, individuals from ancestrally diverse backgrounds will benefit equitably from advances in human genomics. And what I'd like to say about this is that this is unfortunately not the case now, and I'm gonna explain in my view why not, and that I believe we need to tap into the power of statistical and computational methods to make gains towards personalized medicine being our reality. And a lot of this work is um, in a close collaboration that I have with my colleague Lauren Crawford in biostatistics and computational biology here at Brown University, who is also at Microsoft Research. So I'd like to talk to you about a topic you may have heard about, which are genome-wide association, or GWA, studies of disease. And the goal of these studies is to generate hypotheses regarding complex trait architecture from the genetic basis. Um, so what parts of our, our germline genome are influencing certain complex traits um, that we can measure? And they use marginal SNP associations with those traits of interest. So I'm going to go through the mathematical model just to get us all on the same page. But basically, the statistical process underlying a GWA study is quite simple. Here on the y-axis, we have disease state that's measured or a continuous phenotype like height. So this could be a binary outcome like having a cardiac event or not. Um, it could be a continuous phenotype like height or BMI. And on the x-axis here, we have um, just an encoding of genotype. I'm going to call it allelic dosage, but it's the number of copies of a particular mutation at one site in the genome. And so the only values possible here are 0, 1, or 2, um, because we can have at most two copies of the same allele at one site in our genome. Um, so that's why we only have three values on the x-axis. And here's the model. So again, the model is we have a phenotype or trait, and we are regressing that onto um, the number of copies of some reference mutation at this one location in our genome, as well as some covariates. So these could be things like biological sex, if we're studying um, a number of phenotypes that could be different with respect to different uh, biological sex categories. Um, it could be something like height, if we are interested in studying body mass index. Um, and usually routinely, there are different covariates that are used from dimensionality reduction techniques on the genotype matrix, which are meant to remove ancestry-specific spurious correlations with the phenotype. Okay. So basically what is happening in GWAS is site by site in a genomic data set that might have a million sites assayed in the genome, we are testing the hypothesis, is this regression coefficient beta one? Is the slope of this um, term in the regression statistically different from zero or not? That's the goal of GWAS. Um, and nowadays, we often hear about GWAS in a context of prediction. Um, and again, what I want to say about this is that the mathematical models are actually quite simple. It's the application that's not. So in theory, the idea here is that if I have a trait and it has some heritability, there's some aspect of some way that genetics influences that trait, then I can take genotype states and those effect sizes, those beta ones, and I should be able to predict the phenotype state of an individual given their genome. So if I take effect sizes I've measured in a GWAS, and then use those to weight the genotypes of a new individual, I should be able to predict something that's correlated with their phenotype, say their height. Doing this is called generating a polygenic score. It used to, in the past in the literature, be called a risk score when applied to health outcomes, but increasingly it's being called a polygenic index, maybe a PGS, um, and it's being applied in a number of fields. Um, into a number of data types, including behavioral traits. So here's the model. The idea here is that I want to predict some fitted value for the trait, say, you know, a 
something correlated with an individual's height. I'm going to use some set of variants. Initially, when this um, approach was created, the idea was to focus on GWAS um, results that had statistically significant associations with a trait. And I'm going to weight every genotype state in my new individual um, with the effect size that's been measured from a previous GWAS study. So this is a prediction problem. And again, I want to just juxtapose this with the GWAS model from the previous slide. So here, these beta I's are across many sites, the beta 1's from this model. Okay, so recent research um, over the last five years has revealed that GWA results for complex traits, traits that are encoded by many sites throughout the genome, which is many of the health traits we're interested in um, as, we, uh, as we try to uh, reduce the health burden in our population, are unlikely to be relevant outside the discovery cohort. So I'll show you one of the um, first large-scale studies about this, which was led um, by Alicia Martin, who now runs her own group um, at the Broad Institute. And what's being plotted here are polygenic scores for height, or something correlated with height, on the x-axis in a series of populations of African ancestry, um, indigenous American ancestry, East Asian ancestry, European ancestry, and South Asian ancestry. And um, on the y-axis is, uh, these are densities of the observed or the predicted scores in a, in a large scale sample of diverse ancestries. Okay, so here's what the results look like. So um, this was using variants that mutations that were identified as associated with height in individuals of European ancestry from a study uh, done in the giant consortium and then predicting height in a new test set of data. But what the prediction showed was that the prediction would be all European ancestry individuals in the test set who had similar ancestry to the individuals in the training set were predicted to be taller than say all individuals of East Asian ancestry or African ancestry. And we just know that that's not the case. There's variability in height in any of these samples and, and that certainly overlaps, right? So this indicates that there's a problem with our ability to do this prediction out of sample. Um, and actually very recently, um, there's been a study from Molly Chaworski's group led by Hakamanesh Mostafavi and Arbal Harpak and others um, showing that there's even variable prediction accuracy using polygenic scores within a single ancestry. So they analyzed almost 400,000 individuals in the UK biobank who referred or are referred to in the metadata as white British individuals. They're individuals of um, European ancestry. And they found that prediction accuracy varied with a number of covariates, including sex, age, and years of schooling, although I'm not showing uh, those results here. And so they highlighted that a number of covariates influence prediction accuracy, even within one ancestry, probably due to um, gene by environment interactions and many other uh, issues. So one reason I'm particularly interested in this problem of prediction is because my work has focused on the inference of population histories in deep time, and particularly the inference of what are called founder effects or population uh, founding events um, in human evolutionary history. And these events predict an increase in what's called linkage disequilibrium with genetic divergence from Africa. And I'll just say that linkage disequilibrium is sort of a you know, mouthful, um, which geneticists recognize, but I'm going to refer to it as LD. It's also really um, closely related is in fact Pearson's correlation. So it's just correlation in genetic state along a chromosome. But large scale studies of uh, diverse human genomes have identified that there is variability in LD and it's very specific kind of variability with genetic divergence from Africa. So here I'm showing you the first such study that demonstrated this, which was led by Matthias Jakobsen, who's now a professor at Uppsala University when he was a postdoctoral researcher with Noah Rosenberg. Um, at the University of Michigan at the time. So what's here on the x-axis is a proxy for uh, genetic divergence from, from Africa, from the African origin of humans. 
Um, and on the x-axis is this measure of correlation in genotypic state at a fixed window of 10 kilobases, 10,000 base pairs of DNA. So what this study found, which is one of the first two studies um, to apply genotyping technologies or SNP chips to population genetic data sets of diverse individuals, what it found is that LD or the correlation in genetic state along the chromosome is quite short in African ancestry individuals. And that's because population genetic processes, in particular recombination, have had time to break these associations up that occur in these 10 kilobase windows in African ancestry genomes. But they've had less time to do that um, because of the, the serial founder events that have occurred in the peopling of the world and that have influenced genetic variation in um, European ancestry individuals, East Asian ancestry individuals, uh, oceanic in ancestry individuals, and indigenous American individuals. So what this means is these indigenous um, American individuals sampled here in, in South America, Central and South America have very long shared stretches of DNA with each other compared to the individuals um, of African ancestry in this data set. Um, and so the fact that this variability exists among human populations in genetic correlations um, means that we should expect that identifying disease associated or disease causing mutations, as well as uh, mutations that have been beneficial to humans, um, will vary with ancestry. And this plot tells me that we should expect that the prediction of traits will be difficult out of sample when using genome-wide association results. So to go back to the second prediction, why do we know that aren't all individuals aren't benefiting equally from genomics research? Um, one important obstacle to use um, a kind of ML or data science phrase is biased training data. And this is another figure from a paper by Alicia Martin that appeared in Nature Genetics a couple of years ago. On the x-axis, it shows us time since the first GWAS study, which was in 2005, to where the time the paper was written. And what it's showing us is the composition of individuals whose genomes have been studied in genome-wide association studies. So at the time this paper was written, the sample composition from over 4,500 genome-wide association studies revealed that over 90% of the samples represent just 16% of the human population in the world, and that's individuals of European ancestry. So this should immediately tell us that we have a problem, that we have no idea if the results from all of these studies are relevant to most people in the world. And the um, one frustrating thing moving forward is that even as we generate large-scale biobank data sets, which sometimes have tens of thousands or even millions of individuals assayed in them, these inequities aren't changing because researchers aren't analyzing the data that's been gathered from individuals who do not have European ancestry. This has been highlighted in multiple ways recently, but one particular comment was published in Nature in the fall of 2020, um, led by Simone Gravel at McGill University. They surveyed 58 studies that were published analyzing the UK Biobank, which contains genetic data and medical records from half a million residents of the UK, um, as well as a study called the Health and Retirement Study. They found that 45 of these 58 studies did not analyze any data from non-European ancestry individuals, or what they're referring to here as minority populations. And that means that tens of thousands of individuals who have contributed data to these efforts are just being ignored by researchers. We did some work on this recently in my group um, by scraping PubMed publications that referred to UK biobank studies that also had metadata in the GWAS catalog, which is a public resource um, cataloging GWAS studies over time. We focused here from 2012 to 2020. And what we find is that the vast majority of studies that analyze this genetic resource in the UK Biobank, which again has tens of thousands, approximately 100,000 individuals in it who are not of European ancestry, um, those individuals just aren't being analyzed by most uh, studies. Okay, so 
one question that we were thinking about more in my group right now is given that we know linkage disequilibrium or genetic correlation um, differs across ancestries, why exactly are we assuming that mutation level associations from one GWAS studies are going to be relevant across many ancestries? My hypothesis would actually be that we shouldn't expect that. And I think this also lets us interrogate what exactly is the model that we've been basing our genetic association studies on in the last 10 to 15 years. And it's this first model. We've been focusing on the ground truth that um, genetic associations should truly be the same for all individuals. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense from a low hanging fruit standpoint and also from recognizing that there are fundamentally um, important biological truisms that are true for all people. And certainly, um, you know, I don't think that we should expect that individuals of different ancestry have different biology for most traits. But there could be some traits where um, for any set of individuals, not necessarily ones partitioned based on some form of genetic ancestry, they don't share the same mutations that are leading to a trait or a disease, but the same genes are being perturbed by a series of mutations. You could also imagine traits being underwritten by a set of biologically interacting genes, but those could differ across individuals, yet they might all exist in the same pathway that we know to be functionally related biologically. And even something more expansive where there are different pathways that might produce the same trait in different individuals. And we actually have many examples in biology of traits that fall under each of these models. So one of the things we've been thinking about in my group is how we might develop methods that would help us flexibly test any of these models. And again, I wanna underscore that while I'm motivating this using different um, genetic ancestries, this could actually be partitioned based on, um, for example, uh, biological sex, it could be partitioning individuals based on their age um, or based on other environmental uh, covariates. So we have a preprint available on BioArchive that's led by a graduate student in my group named Sam Smith. And um, Sam has analyzed data from over 600,000 individuals who have been assayed for a number of quantitative phenotypes. So the data set is, is quite large. It draws on the UK Biobank that I've mentioned already, as well as a large data set called Biobank Japan. I list the sample sizes in the third column here, um, as well as a study called the PAGE study, um, which is uh, focused on sampling individuals of mixed ancestry in the United States. And these individuals have been assayed for a number of quantitative traits. Um, so these are not binary traits, but examples are things like standing height, triglyceride levels, cholesterol levels, and also uh, glycated hemoglobin. So I want to show you um, some of the results from trying to identify interacting genes that are enriched for mutations associated with triglyceride levels. So if we just focus on the individuals of European ancestry who are from the UK Biobank, we actually, so here I'm not just doing GWAS, I'm using methods developed in my group. There are a series of methods that would give a similar story um, that help us identify genes that are enriched for mutations associated with this trait. And it turns out these genes are also interacting in protein-protein interaction networks. So there's a biologically plausible story happening here. These are apolipoprotein encoding genes, um, which affect how uh, triglycerides are processed in our bodies. So this is the picture I get when I look at these individuals who are white British individuals of the UK Biobank. When I add in Biobank Japan, this um, the association of this network gets uh, underscored even further. There are some genes that have shared associations that are identified in both Biobank Japan, which contains individuals of East Asian ancestry, as well as in the white British cohort in the UK Biobank. But there are also new associations, including with this gene base one, which um, is not listed in the GWAS catalog as associated with triglycerides, but has been identified as influencing triglyceride level, levels in um, medical studies that are not GWASs. And lastly, if I look at the native Hawaiian individuals that the PAGE study has sampled, they're um, a small sample, which in many studies have been ignored. Um, but here, when we, when we analyze them, we find associations that 
if we were just looking at a list of GWAS results, might not look biologically related to the rest of this network, but in fact, these genes are also interacting with this apolipoprotein um, gene subnetwork. So what this tells me um, sort of goes along with the lesson from the parable of the blindfolded men who are each touching different parts of an elephant. And I think that this tells me that while some associations are only going to be identified if we use one set of individuals, we can get a full biological picture and new biological insight if we use these large biobank data sets to their fullest. And if we don't leave information on the table, then we're going to understand more about our shared biology. There are many other challenges in multi-ancestry GWAS studies um, and their interpretation that are being actively studied by population geneticists. And I won't go into them, but just to say there are many researchers working on a series of important motivating questions um, that I want to give credit to and I want to point you to their papers. And I just want to say that all of these areas of inquiry and the methodological advances that are coming from them are really going to help us achieve prediction too. So to move to the last part of the talk, which um, is brief, uh, the last prediction is research in human genomics will have moved beyond population descriptors based on historic social constructs such as race. And I'm very optimistic that this will be the case. Um, and one reason that I'm optimistic for this is I really hope that we will improve study design, but that we will also recognize, by diversifying our studies, uh, but we will also recognize that new methods are needed to gain nuanced biological insight into complex traits. Because I think genetic research can really help us challenge an assumption that exists in many machine learning uh, studies and, and in data science broadly, that more data is somehow all we need to get the truth. There is a truth and we will find it once we have all the data. And I think that what genetics can let us do because the stakes are so high when we study biological traits, medical traits, um, is that we can really define what the truth is and what the truth is about what genetics can and cannot reveal about our history and about our health. And my prediction, if I can add to NHGRI's prediction, is actually that the GWAS studies that have happened and will happen will, when we look back in 10 years, have taught us a lot about how to define phenotypes. I think they'll have taught us a lot about how to study environments and the importance of gene by environment interactions, which I know um, Professor Mbunu will also touch on in his talk. And so like with all data-driven research, I think what we're really going to learn in genomics moving forward and what we should actively start acknowledging and working on is that the decisions that are made by those generating the data and analyzing it will influence the impact that genomics has on our society. So to close, I'd like to tell you about um, a really nice short summary of genomics that Eric Lander, who is now serving the Biden administration as the White House science advisor said, in a talk at the Ig Nobel Prizes um, in 2003. He was summarizing the state of genomics. This is the abstract of his talk, which he had to make seven words or less per the Ig Nobel Prize uh, instructions. Um, Genome, bought the book, hard to read. I think this is a wonderful summary of the state of genomics in 2003. But I'd like to give you my summary um, of what I'm saying in this talk and what my hope is for genomics for the future. Genome, incredible book. Let's read it together. Thank you. Thank you, Sahini. That was wonderful. Um, we have we have uh, we have some questions. I have questions. Um, let me start with a question from Alex. I'm assuming that's Alex Liu, um, who is this is a, a this is a science question. He says, I'm trying to understand how linkage disequilibrium leads to mutations having varying effects on individuals. Is the basic idea that these mutations are occurring in different contexts, like there are mutations in other genes? How does more or less linkage disequilibrium relate to this then? You're muted, hon. <laughs> I mean, Dr. Ramachandran, <laughs> you're still you're still muted. 
of your by hitting the space bar. Welcome to December. While we figure out how to unmute there. Uh, <laughs> if you have other questions, let me know. That's so strange. We're having various technological difficulties today, folks. Sorry about that. Thanks for your patience while we try and figure this out. Uh oh, are we frozen now? Okay. She's leaving and rejoining. Please stay with us just a couple more minutes for a while we get her back on board. The little bug here. I wish I could sing and dance for you. I just saw this video uh, where Adele got all emotional because um, they brought her old teacher who inspired her on stage and she had to cry and stuff. And then she insisted that she had to go fix her makeup. And she pulled a friend up out of the audience to sing for the assembled masses. And I'm sorry, I can't do that. Um, that story about Adele pulling her friend out is the best I can do for you. But look, you're not dropping off. I appreciate you listening to me babble. Uh, maybe this is a nice moment to tell you about um, Brandon Ogbunu's talk coming up because he's dealing with some real similar questions. And remember, reminder, January 26th. Oh, Sohini, you're with us now. Can Hello. You hear, can, Hello, you're back. Hello. All right. So Sorry. glad you're here. Yes. And I want you to know folks hung around. So thank you everybody for hanging around through that. We sure do appreciate it. All righty. Yes. So you were about to answer the question. Yes. Do you remember um, the question? Do you want me to right. I do. I do remember the question. Yes. And um, thank you for that question because I, I didn't, don't want to misrepresent that that linkage to equilibrium or correlation in genetic state would um, would itself induce different genetic architecture of traits across individuals, but it does mean detecting the genetic associations um, will become, will be a function of that LD, especially if LD is differing in our discovery set when we do the GWAS, our, our training set versus our, our sort of new test set. Um, and I, I feel that, um, that my field hasn't fully kind of accepted this there's you know there's the kind of that's what I was trying to present with those sort of four models of biological trait architecture that you know even if the truth is that all traits have the same genetic architecture at heart which you know is probably true for most most traits across all individuals our ability to statistically detect the to statistically characterize the genetic architecture of traits using GWAS and to even even without molecular validation to um, develop targeted hypotheses about which mutations influence traits is going to be complicated by LD. So that was what I was trying to convey there. So I really appreciate the chance to clarify that. All righty, thank you so much. We have a question from somebody uh, anonymous who says the field of anthropology has such an oppressive history linked to colonialization and neocolonialism. I am black from the USA with extended family from Botswana and even the concept Bantu equate with hierarchies created for oppression. And then they go on to ask how is the field of genomics restructuring itself to divest itself of this destructive baggage? And I guess I just wanted to append that that GWA data that you talk about is such a wonderful example of colonialism of data, right? If we're just, ah, everybody's just like Europeans, right? It's it's yeah. another form of it. So so it it is. I'm very intrigued by by how you think about this question because there is there is so much social history tied up in the scientific questions you're pursuing. Yeah. Well, and I I feel so honored to be a part of this series because I think this is more and more um 
what I am thinking about in my own research is not just the is this the context in which our data are gathered, the provenance of the data, and then how we disseminate our results. And I, that's another reason why, you know, obviously I'm biased, but I think genetics is like, uh, population genetics, I think is kind of the OG data science where it's really important <laughs> to make sure we don't have disparate impact and disparate treatment across individuals, right? Um, especially in light of this history. So I guess, you know, not to kind of wordsmith with the, the person asking the question, but I would say it's very important not to divest from this history, but to truly own it and to recognize that it kind of comes back insidiously in a lot of ways, like you mentioned with the composition of data sets with not requiring individuals to analyze all data in these large biobanks. Like we don't really have as a field best practices that are enforced in review. Um, why are we allowed to get access to a large biobank like the UK Biobank and not actually apply our analyses to all data points? It seems that we should be able to, we should have to, and then just, you know, describe the results with caveats about differential statistical power and things like that, but it shouldn't be okay to just ignore data, I think. Um, I think that genomics is working on this but of course we should be doing more. So again, I think there are large pushes to diversify study design, both um, in the US and, and uh, European countries that are developing large biobanks, um, but also across the world. Um, so there are African genomics projects. Um, I think there's a big push, and this is discussed in the new NHGRI strategic plan that I talked about in the beginning, to build capacity for a diverse um, workforce in biomedical research, both again within our own country. But I, I would argue that I would really love to see the National Institutes of Health um, and NHGRI as part of their funding um, also help to promote researchers who are building capacity for individuals from underrepresented groups and, and individuals from all over the world to become conversant, um, you know, excellently trained scientists in, um, in genomics and to who are going to then, you know, work with communities in a way that will undo some of this uh, colonialist history and genetics and anthropology. Um, I think there's a lot more we could be doing to fund international collaborations um, and to also recognize that the impact of research, these are my words, I'm not saying that, that we have any funding entities that describe it this way, but I think that it's it's very natural for grant reviewers, for example, to view impact as a kind of numbers game versus the impact of, you know, gaining new insight into, into genetic variation from groups that haven't been previously given a seat at the table. Obviously, folks like Professor Talbert can talk about the challenges of that as well. It has, work has to be done really, really carefully. Um, but I think, you know, being afraid of engaging with communities and being worried about being insensitive is maybe, I would rather feel uncomfortable <laughs> and do that work than kind of, than, than not. Than not. Um, I also think that Part of what draws people to population genetics is that it's a very exciting interdisciplinary field. It's 100 years old now, but it's long drawn on mathematics. There's also been a long tradition of physicists in population genetics, statisticians, and it's sort of a wonderful discipline that is inherently interdisciplinary. But I also think that moving forward, it's important to, as a population geneticist, own that many other fields and just people every day, you know, people have a fascination with the genome and that it's our job now to kind of go outside from our field and to push um, for the way that genetics is taught in school, in primary school, to be taught in not this deterministic way that your genome is a blueprint and everything in your life emanates from your genome. For, you know, we, we should re be rewriting the way we're educated about genetics. We should also be going to other fields that are now using genomic data, like sociology, for example, um, economic studies, and kind of asking, you know, what is genetic data really buying you here? Why do you want to invoke these data to make your argument and engaging in that? And I think that that's gonna be the step forward.
All right, we have a few more questions and some praise in the comments, but uh, we are out of time and those are such eloquent words. I'm um, I uh, I will I will take your message. I'd rather be uncomfortable than not do this work because I think that's what a lot of this work comes down to and you're dealing with. I could ask you questions all day because I'm so fascinated by this juncture where sort of hard science and, and math meet these really social questions and of course, as as Dr. Talbert talks about, everybody is is inclined to privilege the scientific perspective. So it seems so important to figure out how do we break out of the idea of race science, I guess yes. would be a way to say it. Right. Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, thank you so, 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 so much. And um, I hope we'll get to talk to you more. And we're really so, so pleased you were with us. And thank you, everybody who came stayed with us through challenging tech difficulties and to those of you watching on the recording i'm glad you got to see it so bye and see you january 26th with brandon Ogbunu. thank you bye bye <laughs>